Welcome back to this book right here. My name is Scott Woods. I'm a writer and librarian, and I created this book right here to share books in my personal collection. They may be books that are uh, that you know, or they may not. They may be older, or they may be newer, probably older. But no matter how it shakes out, they're books that I feel intensely about and believe everyone should read. Today is a special episode. I won't be talking about a specific book per se. I want to talk about book art and why that art is sometimes important to how we engage a book. This will be quick and short, so let's just dive in, all right? When I was growing up, there wasn't what you would call a YA or young adults market. They made books for children and books for adults, and you read whatever book you were capable of reading. As you can imagine, that meant as a child who learned to read at three, I frequently came across books that I arguably had no business reading. I grew up in a house that had several readers of various ages with lots of books, so I just read whatever looked intriguing. But my fascination started where it starts with most readers uh, in my youth and with books supposedly intended for young readers. One of my formative reads for the art, specifically for the art, was this one. The Horror Anthology, edited by Helen Hoke, Monsters, Monsters, Monsters. It came out in 1974. I didn't catch up with it for another several years, like when I was in first grade or so. Uh, the cover, as you can see, was compelling. And all children have a fascination with monsters. So this one practically leaped off the shelf at me in the school library. Uh, and once I started going through the pages and seeing the Charles Keeping illustrations, like, I mean, come on, like, what? What? I mean, like, I mean, it's just like every story has the, what? What? Ugh, I mean, like, this art is still a trip. You know what I'm saying? It's still a trip. I'll show you one more. Like, what? This was in my first grade school library. Anyhow. Um, and so, once I started going through those pages, I was hooked, right? What I didn't know at the time was that it was a collection of, like, already classic stories by famous authors like Bradbury, Poe, uh, Wells, so on and so forth. And that's my point, is that the art got me into the book, which got me into a whole slew of writers who I read and model myself after to this day, to this day, uh, in one aspect or another. So book art works, and it is important for that reason. Which brings me to today's bit of advice. When possible, it's not always possible, right? But when possible, find the right art for your book. Uh, this is a piece of advice that applies like almost daily for parents or educators, but I find it works uh, equally with adult readers with broader palettes, right? Uh, because there are plenty of illustrated adult books. Let's not act like everybody wasn't losing their minds over the Griffin and Sabine trilogy in the early 90s, right? Like, we was really, we was really into this. And art was like half the battle. Uh, matter of fact, I recently got turned on to a new book, uh, Slewfoot by Brahm, right? Which, I mean, look at this art, <laughs> just real quick. It's terrifying. Like what? What are we doing? What's happening here? What? What? what, we, what I mean, what are we doing? Right? Like, that's terrifying. I can't wait to start it, is the point, right? So, anyhow. So, let me drive the point home with a particular book that everybody will know. Road Dolls 
James and the Giant Peach. One of my faves. Um, this was published in 1961, right? Uh, and James and the Giant Peach was originally illustrated by Nancy Eckholm Burker. This is a first edition copy, so I have that art, and you could tell by the raggedness of the jacket. It's mad original. Can't, I, that's how I found it. I didn't do that to it. Um, but when I first read this book um, in elementary school, this was the edition that I had. And because of the art in it, I was like completely absorbed, and it became one of my favorite books of all time. Anyhow, um, and just as a piece of trivia, um, Nancy Eckholm Burkert, this was her first illustration job, as it turns out, right? So she came out the gate like swinging. Uh, anyhow, this book, if you recall, is a fantasy that is kind of dark. Uh, the titular protagonist, James, is suddenly orphaned on page one. When his parents are eaten by an escaped rhinoceros from the zoo. Uh, he's sent to live with his two aunts, who in true fairy tale fashion uh, are evil people. Uh, James's grief is compounded by the misery of neglect and abuse. Uh, you know, look, Road, Road Doll was wild, right? Um, anyhow, one particularly hot day when James is about to catch a verifiable whooping in the yard. He runs off and encounters a strange little man in the bushes who is easily a top 10 creepiest dude in all of children's literature. Easy. Top 10. Uh, he calls James over. Creepy. He asks James to see what's in his bag. Creepy. He called James my dear. Creepy. It was pretty much textbook stranger danger situation. Uh, naturally, James ignores all the red flags and engages the little man who then proceeds to give him a bag of crocodile tongues stewed in the skull of a dead witch with lizard eyes. It's like a whole thing. They look like little wormy seeds. Uh, basically a bag of wriggling magic seeds. All right. Uh, now, here's where I, I feel the need to reiterate how there wasn't a young adult market yet. Yes, there were books we might consider YA today, uh, but there was no way to find them collectively. Like, there was no section. It was the Wild West for advanced readers back then. So a weird book like this was ripe for censorship, and it still is. Um, what's funny about this is, like, on the cover, there's, there's no indication necessarily that it's a children's book. Like, you see a kid on the cover, but they don't actually say anything about that until you get to the title page, and it says... A children's story. <laughs> Word roll? Word? Okay, if you say so. Um, anyhow, long story short, James loses the seed in the yard. He trips over a root or something. And the seeds go under an old peach tree. The tree, which has never grown a peach before, suddenly sprouts one. And it continues to grow and grow like you need, like before your very eyes until it's the size of of a house and so naturally the aunts are like well this is amazing and we're gonna flip this into like a tourist attraction in which they immediately do somehow and so at the end of the day after a day of visitors James is ordered to go out into the yard and pick up all the trash that all of the visitors left in the yard banana peels and whatever um, and at that point he discovers a hole in the peach big enough to walk in which, of course, he does. And then when he gets to the pit, there's like a door. And he opens the door and he encounters <laughs> several human-sized insects who were also transformed by the seeds. And then the adventures really begin. So now let's talk about the art, okay? That's what we're here to do, so let's talk about that. Um, in the original edition, the art is downright creepy, right? As time passes... And the book goes through numerous reprints. Uh, the art keeps changing until it neuters the story. Um, here's what I mean. I'll show you three scenes, each with art from different editions. Here is James 
in the 1961 original edition. This is page one. This is James. Can you see him? That's James, page one, 1961. He's creepy. That's a creepy looking kid, man. Now, I, I would show you the same picture on the same page one in this 1995 edition uh, drawn by Quentin Blake. But there isn't a drawing of James on page one. In fact, they changed the text. The first line of the book is different. Presumably so they wouldn't have to draw, you know, so they could save money or time or whatever on illustrations. Which I don't know why. It's not like Blake put in a bunch of effort. I mean, look at this. Here is an actual picture of James, like a couple of pages later. This is after his parents have died, uh, killed by a rhinoceros, right? Ooh, creepy, right? Like, the picture I showed you of James before was before his parents died. Here's the same picture after. Look at that haunted child. Haunted, I say. Then, I have another edition to show you. Uh, this is from the 1996. So this is like a year later from the... 1995 version that I showed you. There, there's James. He looks sad, right? Woo. Oh, okay. I guess. Oh, and for the record, this uh, version, this 96 version, right, is illustrated by Lane Smith. All right. Um, and so you see in the 61, the original, the 61 version, you know, the art is like already, just like out the gate. Like letting you know what you're dealing with. Here is the scene about the old creepy dude. Where James meets the creepy dude who gives him the seeds. Here is the 1961 illustration of said dude. Look at that creep. Look at him. He's terrified. He might be alien. I mean, what? And the description of him is like... Not particularly creepy. Like his behavior is what's creepy about him, right? Doll just writes him like pretty much like, oh, a little man, old, walking on a stick, you know, whiskers, you know. But Burkert just says, nah, this dude needs to be as creepy as he sounds. So what, what does Quentin Blake do with that same information? He gives, he gives us this this he gives us shell silverstein on a stick this is what is i mean come on man first of all the dude ain't creepy i mean it would i mean this is just this is not compelling art you know that's that's not where it's at man and then again a year later in the 96 version you know um you know lane smith again you know is trying to get it get it back you know, to some to the creepiness, but you know, not so much. No, nothing too crazy. I mean, it's a little weird, but you know, not the burker. One more, one more page. So the scene where James meets the insects, the human-sized insects, who initially uh, is you know come off very terrifying. Right here, they are, 1961 edition. Boom! Look at them. Look at them. Like even the bugs that are harmless in general are are kind of terrifying here, right? Like that grasshopper is not cool, man. Look at the ladybug's arm. I mean, what? No. Uh uh. Yeesh. So. Yes, the insects are wearing clothes and sitting on furniture and talking. Um, but, I mean, kind of creepy, right? They're clearly insects. Uh, in the 1995 version, again, Blake. Uh, here's the same scene. Here's, here's what they look like. 
This is our first impression of these terrifying insects. Look at them. They look goofy. Thanks to Blake's loose style, they are silly looking. They're wide-eyed. They're more like things with human faces than they are insects. All right. In the 1996 Crane version, or Smith version, I'm sorry, um, again, we get kind of more of a return to form, but eh, eh. tries to put some edge back into it, right? A little psychedelic, right? But it's not, but you know, Smith is not what I would call scary, right? So these scenes, these three scenes are important bricks in the foundation of the doll's story. James should look miserable and sad. The old man should come off creepy and weird. And the insects should be terrifying at first blush, especially since their very first conversation with James is all about how hungry they are right after he walks in the door. So that he think he's finna get eaten. And we think he's finna get eaten. So the art changes how the story is received. And while... You know, Quentin Blake's art has always been too loose for me. Um, you know, it has none of the mischief or dread that is inherent in the writing. You know, none of that ever makes it into the art. And that is a disservice to the story. And I caution you, because Quentin Blake has done, as I recall, several doll interpretations. And I'm telling you not to read those editions. Go look for the other ones. Pick and choose your edition. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, whenever you can, choose your art carefully. It has everything to do with how you process the story. When in doubt, go as far back as you can uh, before we knew what we were doing to ourselves. Thanks for watching. This book right here, James and the Giant Peach, 1961 version, is always going to be amazing no matter how you get it. But if, the further back you go, the better it gets. Thanks for hanging out.